Hello everyone, it's Aaron Schimmel, DevOps.com, and we're here on another great DevOps webcast. Got a great webcast lined up for everyone today on this Monday, whether it be morning, afternoon, or evening, depending where you are in the world. Uh, today's webcast is Three Secrets to Help You Modernize Your Database Environment. And, and modernizing it needs, we, it was a busy week last week, we'll talk a little bit about it in our, in our webcast. But before we do and introduce our panelists, let me just quickly remind everyone, we have set aside time for questions. If you look at your GoToWebinar control panel, you'll see there's a section marked questions. If you click the carrot or arrow so that it's facing downwards, that, uh, that uh, section will expand. Guys, type your questions in in real time. Don't wait till the end to type your questions. If a lot of questions come in, you may not get your question answered. Where if you type it in as it pops into your head, it's queued, we'll get to them. And even if we can't get to them live on here, we have a written record of them and we can get you at written responses if necessary. So please write your questions in there. It makes for a much better webcast when we have questions that we could line up and, and get happening for that section. Also, if you're having any technical issues, the slides aren't, uh, you know, responding or moving. The audio's not working. Please use the chat section of the uh, go to webinar control panel, and we do have engineers standing by who will try to help you. And uh, but it, you know, but that's not for your questions. Ask questions and questions. That being said, let me answer the first question we always get, which is, is this webinar being recorded? Yes, the webinar is being recorded. The slides will be available. It'll be up on DevOps.com, as well as our DevOps TV YouTube channel. And I believe it'll be over at the DB Maestro site as well. So with that being said, let us move on to today's webinar. As I mentioned, our webinar today is sponsored by DB Maestro, DevOps for Databases. And our two presenters today are two people Actually, we were both at the same uh, the same uh, conferences last week, and there are two people I've actually had the pleasure of presenting with before. First of all, we have uh, from CA Atomic Software our friend Scott Wilson, uh, ARA Product Marketing Director. Scott, welcome. Thank you, Alan. Pleasure to be here. And of course, Glad. as always, it was great to see you last week. Yep, and then. The star of today's uh, webcast is Yaniv Yehuda, who's co-founder and CTO at DB Maestro. Yaniv, welcome. Hey, Alan. Hey, everybody. Pleasure being here uh, again. Looking forward for today's webinar. Fantastic. Okay. Before we before I hand things over, Yaniv, let me quickly go over the agenda with our our audience. If we could proceed to the next slide. So, couple of, couple of things we're going to uh, hit hit on. Number one, and if you take nothing else out of it, take this. Three secrets to help you modernize your database environment. But we're also going to base this on some of the latest insights and observations from uh, a couple of places. Number one, as Scott mentioned, I saw him at CA World in Las Vegas last week, and it was DevOps as far as the eye can see. I came to Las Vegas from San Francisco as did Yaniv, actually, who was also in Vegas and San Francisco, for the fourth annual DevOps Enterprise Summit there, which was sold out, and uh, I thought in many ways the best does yet. It had a lot of great, great speakers. And then last but certainly not least was the DB Maestro 2018 Database DevOps Survey, and, and Yaniv will be sharing some of the key findings from that with us. But we're going to talk about how winning organizations are bringing database into their DevOps culture, and it's about time, and how to ensure the right balance between developer liberty capability, DevSecOps controls, which is obviously a very big topic today, and, and database controls, which is also a, a very big topic. And then lastly, how to extend the best practices gained <laughs> through our, all of our collective blood, sweat, and tears in your DevOps environment and bring that to the database. So a great agenda. Let's get started. Yaniv, I'm going to hand it over to you. Let's make it happen. Uh, thanks a lot, Alan. Uh, Scott, uh, your slides are first. Uh, a pleasure. 
Yeah, so Go just ahead. to talk about, uh, as you said, about uh, how things went at CA World. Uh, Alan, you kind of summarized it the best. It was DevOps all the way around. The, the real focus for CA, of course, right now is the automating the modern software factory, and that represents, of course, why there was such a focus of DevOps, DevSecOps, uh, DevOps automation throughout CA World, and that was really a, a large focus of everything. I found there was a lot of great interest people have. Uh, uh, having spoke to a lot of the folks who come, they come from large enterprises, and they're looking for ways to scale out these uh, DevOps practices, and one of the keys to doing that, of course, is automation. So I found there were a lot of people who are interested in both automation and just what CA has to offer at an enterprise scale and help them with their diverse enterprise uh, portfolio in obtaining DevOps. So Yaniv, um, you were there as well. Uh, what were your, your thoughts? Uh, I think really uh, next slide is really all about it. Uh, it it's DevOps or die. Uh, I think it's, it's the, the, the interesting information we got from questions that we were asked there, you know, in person, your, your sessions, my sessions, uh, you know, the survey that we did, it's, it's DevOps is no longer something that you're considering uh, if you're going to do, or, or when are you going to do, you see, you see an urgency. It's it's not just startups. It's, it's enterprises, all looking into DevOps and saying this is something we have to do. And and Jim Kin re really said it first, or or maybe not first, but he's one of the, the the you know the biggest voices out there talking about why this is so critical. And it's like something that you can see repeatedly going again and again. If you're an enterprise, uh, mid-size, if you're smaller, you have a lot to gain from, from, from DevOps, from automation, from changing the practices to, to really meet uh, these, these modern processes and, and make sure that, that you gain from the collective, uh, collective improvement of, of, of today's, you know, uh, I said modern processes, but this is what it is. It's just, uh, uh, information that you gather and, and processes that are improving and, and, and better and better and better yet uh, uh, ways to implement uh, development and operations and, and, and to ship out you know fast. so yeah definitely I was was you know it was fascinating to see that uh, again in, in you know in, in a show and, and, and meet the people yep and this I mean, slide is great uh, you know, Sorry. DevOps or die, it's, um, as we say, as, as the quote says, right, enterprise DevOps isn't mandatory, but neither survival. And, um, and you mentioned yeah, exactly. you know, a lot of the people I talk to there, they feel the pressure, and enterprises definitely do, and it is real pressure. Um, a lot of the companies that are starting a startups, they come in using these streamlined uh, processes. It, in some ways it reminds me way back, although this isn't that far back, but when the JetBlue Airlines came on board, right? One of the first things they did right out of the gates, and what they did with their initial seed money, is they bought any kind of software or other kind of mechanic automation software that they could, recognizing that they wanted to start out right out of the gate with a very streamlined uh, process for everything realizing that that was what was going to help them differentiate themselves in the market. And in, in, in today's society, that's the advantage a lot of startups have, right? They don't have a large enterprise portfolio, so they can invest in modern practices like DevOps and other tooling where the enterprise, um, as it says, you know, neither survival, we have to adapt in order to compete with these new startups because they're not just little startups, are they? They very quickly rise and become uh, competitors. No, absolutely. Yeah. As it, it really, as it says, this is a great quote from, from Jim Kim. You don't have to have it. It's not mandatory. But you're just going to lose. You're going to lose to a competition. You're going to lose to the market. You're not going to be able to deliver uh, uh, fast enough or to be agile enough. Uh, it's, it's just, you know, this is where everybody's uh, going. And, and you don't have to, but this is what you need to do. You know, Yanni, I'd like to throw something out at you and Scott along these lines. 
of an observation I had specifically at the DevOps uh, Enterprise Summit this year. And that is that some people were saying, boy, this DevOps isn't as easy as I thought it was, right? And, and my DevOps isn't proceeding as quickly as we maybe thought. And while DevOps or die is also is very true, DevOps isn't necessarily easy is true. You, you don't under you know this is a this is an undertaking of changing corporate culture, changing processes, technologies, and it's not something to be done lightly, right? You just don't wake up and say, you know what, it's Monday, I'm going to roll DevOps out across the board today. So, something else for people to, you know, if you're going to go with DevOps and there's a lot of reasons to do it, take the time to do it right. Don't don't think just you just snap your fingers and poof, your DevOps. But with that, I'll let you go ahead no, from there. No, absolutely, Alan. I, and I think really it's, it's not just, it's not about snapping your fingers. It's, it's, it's having like uh, an agreement to do this. And, and you have to have the agreement from, from, from management and, and, and the technical people. And, and you can't drag people into DevOps, you know, kicking and screaming, because you need to have everyone's a, a corporation to, to have that really roll out successfully and, and, and just a quick note on that, the best success that I've seen uh, uh, up, you know, from my uh, humble experience, uh, uh, the best success that I've seen for rolling out DevOps is start small, uh, show victories, show success stories, and then you get everybody's appetite to really uh, uh, go forward with that. So if you try to start big, uh, this is really where people, I think, uh, are stumbling. So get these uh, critical projects, get these, I don't know, uh, uh, maybe potential uh, uh, hooks, and, and, and show the success. And, and this is where it becomes easier to roll, roll out that DevOps uh, uh, mindset in, into a company. Yep, and Alan, just to add to what you're saying, what you're both saying, um, just be patient. A lot of the companies I have visited that are doing a lot of DevOps or who've made some transformations, it's taken a couple of years or more to make it happen. There's just a lot of, it just takes a lot of effort. So don't get frustrated, don't give up. It'll just take some time. And I find one of the key things is to educate upper management. But um, yeah, let's dig into some numbers. I, I, think, I think, Scott, to, to, you're saying exactly we can see in these numbers how, how this takes time and, and, and how you can actually do that gradually. So go ahead, this, this supports exactly what you just said. Right, so we can see uh, you know, the adoption rate. If you look at it versus the SMB and the, uh, the enterprise scale, right? It's got, uh, the numbers are saying there's a whole lot more interest um, at the enterprise scale, 84% versus 72%, uh, yet, I think a lot of this is more kind of DevOps awareness. Yes, we need to do this. Enterprises are obviously feeling the, the pressure a lot more. But it tends to be more project-based, right? And we see that to the, the graph to the right. 40% uh, or we're showing about half, up to half, of all of the enterprises are, are using the DevOps approach on more of a project or team-based approach. And this is where why I say it could take a while, and it, it can, because you've got to convince multiple teams uh, many times you have to convince management to play mom and dad or to release funds to really uh, make these initiatives actually occur. And one of the things that these the graphs here do show, of course, is the progression we're making um, year over year, right? Uh, teams, it, it's starting to spread. One of the things that doesn't these graphs don't show that I have seen is that many companies um, are bringing in C-level executives specifically to do DevOps. Now, this isn't so new as in many boards are bringing in CEOs to do digital transformation. That is known. But what I'm also seeing in talking to many DevOps practitioners and visiting many companies is that go down one level to like a CIO or so forth. These folks are often being promoted internally and being brought in as folks who actually understand DevOps because the old guard didn't, and they weren't able to implement the, or the practices or encourage or enforce those practices at an enterprise scale. So yes, 
we're, we're growing, we're coming, but it's just going to take a little bit of time. And uh, don't get frustrated. The fight's worth fighting, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So look at this another way. Um, now I mentioned that was like by by kind of project, right? That is, that's the first place to start, or by team. That's okay. You can see when it comes to DevOps, as we've often said, what does it mean? Uh, it means different things to different people. If we look at this under the context of deliver continuous delivery, well, application development. I mean, that's just a given, right? And of course, we're seeing a whole lot more adoption for that, and it's it's very close tangent testing. Again, we see a very good uh, correlation there. But where things start to fall down and track uh, downwards is when we start hit talking about databases in the context of continuous delivery infrastructure and surprisingly even in the modern age, modern today, security. We, we start hitting uh, with those last three to the, to the one-third to uh, two-thirds ratio, which is, um, you know, a, a pretty, pretty stunning. When you yeah, consider, that, yeah, Scott, Scott. Let me just uh, 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 highlight something. Uh, I, I, I'm, I have to say that something fell uh, incorrectly in this slide. It says uh, fully versus no interest. It's not. It shouldn't be no interest. It should be not implemented yet. And and I think Correct. really this is, this is really the the dilemma that we see. We see, uh, you know, uh, uh, we see security getting left far behind. Uh, but also infrastructure and databases. Everybody's starting from the application side. There's great solution like CA automation, uh, like the well-known Jenkins out there helping people implement and start implementing processes. But this is really where they start the process. And, and the more they go forward, you realize that you can do part of this. You can do uh, application DevOps and, and not do database or infrastructure or security. So DevSecOps is there for a reason because you can't do this partially. You're just not doing DevOps to the fullest. And, 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 and this is really where the challenge is because if you're looking like uh, on the graph on, uh, on the right side and, and you see that DBA teams are still a silo, okay? Uh, and a lot of times they're not part of, of, of the DevOps uh, uh, agenda. They're not uh, uh, participating in teams or maybe just a bit, then obviously it's, it's something that which, which is incomplete. You cannot have something automated for one side of the application and yet run and do manual stuff on the other side. And this is really where uh, we hit a lot of barriers that some of them will, will mention in, uh, in today's webinar. Uh, but I think this is, this is really where, uh, where DevOps starts to, to mature and, and, and to start you know, solving everything and not just specific aspects of, of, of application development. That's correct, Yanni. Even, you know, the graph to the right, if we just isolate one of the ops team's um, members, the DBAs, we can see that we're basically at the two-thirds to one-third ratio here as well, that DBAs either are not involved, or we're seeing a full fifth, uh, or to some extent, if you combine those, you're looking at about two-thirds of the time or the folks they're not involved and in fact the graphs to the left also show this now I personally think this is a problem with DevOps because there is kind of an undercurrent of dev no ops um, and there, there are several reasons why I think under the DevOps context there's this uh, propensity to circumvent operations um, but if you go to the next side uh, next slide Yaniv one of the things I want to point out about the dev no ops mentality is the, the great danger in allowing your DevOps team to become polarized or become homogenous, right? Now, there's a great book, highly recommend it to everyone, called The Wisdom of Crabs. And James Surowiecki, he breaks down the big problem of polarized groups. I'll read the quote from him in his book. He says that non-polarized groups consistently make better decisions and come up with better answers than most of their members. And surprisingly, often the group outperforms even its best members. Now, he, throughout the book, he brings out the case. He talks about the Columbia 
space shuttle disaster and many other use cases and basically talks about that for groups to be smart they have to have um, diverse opinions and those uh, diverse groups need a bit of autonomy to represent their ideas and their thoughts into decision making. So I think one of the challenges or one of the dangers rather of having a polarized DevOps group aka Dev NoOps is that you're putting a particular set of specialists in a position to go fast without fully weighing the considerations of a bunch of other specialists. So we wind up going fast very blindly. And as the book articulates how dangerous polarized groups, this quote here shows you the exact opposite of if you have a diverse set of people that are involved in a process, how that a group, even with, um, shall we say, um, if, if you were to go on the IQ scale and you say you had a bunch of geniuses, and amongst these geniuses, you had a, a bunch of, uh, I don't know, freshman high schoolers, for example, uh, in that group. That group would outperform a group that had just a bunch of PhDs on it. That's what the study shows up. And that, that has to do with the fact that these folks who are less educated or less knowledgeable, in my example here, have a perspective, thus an expertise, that the other quote-unquote experts don't, thus making the group smarter than even the smartest members, individual members. So I just throw this out here. It's something that's not talked about much, but I, when we talk DevOps, I really think it's important, especially when we talk about the enterprise security breaches and all the different specialties. And we're talking a bit about databases here. There's just so many nuances in each one of these roles and each one of these, these uh, technology stacks that applications touch that it's just important that we're very inclusive with DevOps and that we avoid the dev no ops mindset and culture. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it absolutely makes perfect sense to me. You know, sometimes it, it's it's funny, you know, from personal a aspect. I'm I'm talking to my wife and she said, you know, why don't you, you do this and that? And and I you know just think, okay, that that was actually quite a different point of view that than what I had. Sometimes so simplistic that you know it just might definitely work better than any other complicated solution. So Definitely having a diversity is, is, you know, that's, that's, that's always better than having a unified opinion of how to do stuff and, and, and not being smarter by that, that visitors that might have a different point of view. So let's, uh, we did say three secrets. So let's, let's talk about some, some of the interesting stuff that we learned both from, you know, uh, talks that we had and um, you know uh, the survey that we mentioned and, and, and things that just come up you know uh, in, in, in uh, customers or, or prospects discussions and when we talk about database and, and, and the processes that we have we can see a, a, an elaborated uh, flow of, of, of you know what it takes to really do changes in the database so I won't go through the details but it is uh, something that if you do manually and if you want to have the, 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 the flexibility that people tend to want can be quite challenging so you, you if starting from the left side of, of, of that uh, uh, flowchart uh, you need to introduce changes and you're working maybe with your git or subversion uh, uh, source repository it's challenging to follow you know to, to follow what actually gets into your uh, source control and when you ship it out and debug it, how to make sure that you don't have code overrides. And when you're going forward to maybe testing environments, how to prevent conflicts with other teams. And at the same time, someone is doing some hot fixes to production, only to find out that, you know, while pushing it back, maybe it overrides someone else's changes or even just stays in production. Because, you know, in every DBA uh, history, you have that, uh, uh, that war stories about getting in, in 4 a.m. to to fix something so uh, you'll have that next day or running and, 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 and up to spec but that hotfix to production really sometimes don't it doesn't make it back to development so the next release could override it and, and, and break it so there's a lot of manual processes a lot of pitfalls that could break your releases so one of the interesting stuff that we learned from from the the survey uh, that we just concluded is is uh, the graph on the on the left 
and 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 there seems to be quite uh, a repeating set of of pitfalls and and and, and issues that that people are 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 hitting like accidental overrides a person makes a change someone else overrides it because the database you know anybody who has permission can just go in and override it and you would say okay not a lot of people should have permissions but when you realize that's on on the right side of, of maybe the ops side of, of, of the pipeline on pre-production or production that makes sense but the more you go to the left side development integration testing a lot of people have credentials to go in and make changes and this is where you're hitting uh, the roadblocks because people are introducing changes they're overriding each other there's no clear process to introduce changes or to track who's doing what so it's 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 just you know, 20, almost 20% 20 of the people are, are overriding each other's code and, and, and changes, which is a lot. This is something that we've solved for traditional or application development decades ago. This is, this is considered a, no, a non-issue, yet for database, this is one of the biggest issues. And, and going down the list, let me just mention a couple of more issues. Invalid code, maybe, you know, a, develop, a developer writes something that doesn't work correctly. Where do you test it? Where do you f fail? Where, where do you want to fail? You know, you, you want to find out about these issues as early as you want in, 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 in the process, you know, because the more you go to the right side, to the upside, the more uh, uh, an error is costly and the more time it takes to change it and, and, and the, biggest, the bigger the, the, the rework and, and, and its consequences. So this is an issue, conflicting between teams. So a team issues in a hotfix, another team issues a, a, a feature that overrides that hotfix. How can you manage these things? How can you make sure that changes are put in, in a specific order, that you don't have undocumented hotfixes, as I mentioned, that happens a lot to, to, to production and pre-production? Or how do you make sure that people are making set of changes and you actually have the whole set uh, remembered and, and tagged and, and correctly logged to make sure that everything goes forward and you're not running it only to find out that everything works in development and things are failing when you move to the next environment, maybe integration, and you found out that something was actually done to development, never tagged anywhere, never logged anywhere, was not part of version control, and now you have a failure and everybody lost time, more cycles and, and, and slowest or slower uh, time to market. So there's a lot of, of, of challenges that, that we see. And uh, for specific, I'm, I'm going to mention things that we do in DMS to help solve these problems is instead of having that um, perspective of two isolated processes, one for development and, 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 and tracking application changes and tracking database changes and another to actually uh, have the database as a separate resource that changes might go in directly into the database that might be in the source control or changes might go into the source control which are not in the database that whole process needs to change and follow the best practices that exist for code and this is just by simply solving one quick problem enforcing the the, the change process, making sure that just like for, for code, if, if you have that Java code and you make a change and you don't check it out and check it in, it's not influencing anybody. So it's not part of the build, it's, it's not going to break anything. But for the database, if you make a change to the database and you're not logging it, it's just going to work. And, 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 and you really hear that a lot, you know, almost everywhere. Well, it, it works in my station, it works on my environment and it breaks on the next. Why? Because it was not properly uh, uh, tagged. So having that enforced check-in, check-out, make sure that nobody can introduce changes uh, uh, to the database without properly having uh, the labels, the revisions, the change history, know what's happening, who's doing what, and, and really to be able to identify changes and, 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 and deal with you know, parallel changes, maybe a team changes something and another th team changes something else, it helps you to get to a better place when everything is uh, 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 documented. So um, essentially uh, what we've seen, the, the, the success stories that, that we've seen, and, and, and this is from a credit card company, the, the first uh, uh, thing there, 15% uh, of, of productivity gains on, on development is huge. 
This is not something that may, may represent every customer. Sometimes it's uh, 5%, sometimes it's 6 or 7 and in extreme cases it might be more because in that specific in, uh, environment in, in, in the credit card company I, I mentioned, they actually had a, a planned release once a week but they ended up having a release on, on Sunday and a fix-up release on Monday, uh, Tuesday, sometimes Wednesday and Thursday which is of course huge because they spend a lot of their time having to do rework because things were missed, things were forgotten, things were in, introduced in, a, in, a, in an improper way and they just kept breaking and breaking and breaking the releases. But once they had that clear process to do development then there were no more accidental code overrides, it was a complete set of changes that could be correlated to a requirement a release was, you know, out out the door successfully the first time, or considerably less uh, uh, rework uh, uh, requirement uh, from other aspects, and they really saved a lot of time on that uh, 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 on that thing that that is called source control. And you would say, yes, absolutely, source control. But source control needs to take into account the database, and in order to do that, it needs to be highly connected, uh, so you don't have that disconnect between your source control that people should work with and the database that people are actually testing the changes with uh, and, and, and have that gap that they're not in sync in, uh, in, in some of the cases and, and that of course is, is challenging. So uh, moving to, to, to the second interesting, very interesting uh, thing that, that, that we always knew but we really were able to measure this in, in quite an accurate uh, uh, manner on, on, on the different surveys and, and, and this last one as, as well. So who's actually introducing changes to the database and, and, and how? So I start by saying that this is something that I've actually set down on, uh, in a company, uh, a financial company in, uh, in Europe. I, I had the chance to visit them and see uh, in real time the conflict between developers and, 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 and DBAs. Uh, this is a qu quite a large company. They had uh, close to a thousands of, of, of developers and, and a very big DBA team, uh, a few dozens, uh, which is, I, I, I would say it, it doesn't represent what we usually uh, uh, see from, uh, you know, a number of DBAs perspective. Uh, it, it's a big number. Sometimes you have more, but this is not what we see usually in the market. Usually there's a, there are fewer DBAs. And they were saying, okay, so we have a very, very clear process to introduce changes. Uh, each time um, either a DBA or a developer is creating a change, uh, he talks to the DBA, the DBA realizes, you know, what is that change, where, did, where does it need to go to, uh, he looks at the database, uh, see that it's ready to accept that change, uh, do the change, actually document and hopefully document what, what they were doing and then look at the database and see that everything went in uh, uh, successfully. And this is a really robust process. This process has been working for, for years. The only problem, it's slow. It is slow. And if you have a release every three, six, nine months, that might be very, very uh, successful for you. And we'll visit some of the statistics of, of database failures in, in, in a few slides and you could actually see these teams working very, very successfully. The problem is that we can no longer afford moving at that pace. We are required to issue releases uh, every two weeks, three weeks, sometimes uh, continuously and this immediately becomes a very big problem because just consider, I, I mentioned the numbers games, the, the, the uh, amount of developers versus DBAs and these developers are running agile. They have releases going out again and again and again and, and you have multiple teams, each one with their own cycles, pushing their changes and they hit the wall. They hit the wall when they want to ship their changes and, and, and actually if you, if you think about it, there's no way to win that numbers game because on one side you want the DBAs to run that uh, safe process that I've just mentioned and on the other side you have these uh, developers who has to deliver their changes because the business needs to do it. So 
the, 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 this stress is, 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 is very real and, and, and blame storing is, is inevitable because developer, uh, developers would say, let us have control over the releases. We need to run faster. We cannot wait for that bottleneck. Sorry to be calling you bottleneck, but it is what it is. We cannot wait for you. We cannot wait for the DBAs. And the DBAs would say, well, uh, you want us to keep delivering the, 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 the the, the, the reliability and, 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 and actually the database is our responsibility. We cannot give you direct access to the releases because we need to review your changes. We need to make sure that you don't break your database. We need to review that the database is up to spec uh, before a change, after a change, everything is okay. And, and, and this is really, you know, the, the base of, of code versus database. For code, you can, you, there's a great saying, uh, uh, fail fast, fail often, and continuously improve your processes. If you do that on the database side, if you fail fast, stop. Pay the price of failing fast and now decide what you want to do. If you drop that table, if you drop that uh, index on production midday, your application is going to crawl time now. It's, 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 it's not going to be something that you can also fix immediately. Rebuilding that 200 million records uh, index is going to take a day or I don't know, or, or if you lost something that you don't have a proper backup of, this is going to be a nightmare. So moving from uh, code to database implementation of, of automation needs to be practiced in a safer way because the cost of, of downtime or the, the, uh, the chance of breakage is higher. If something is wrong with your latest release on, on your Java, you could uh, with C automation, with, with a lot of other tools, you can very easily create that rollback scheme and, 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 and revive that previous uh, version and, 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 and work fine. But if you break something on your database, this is going to be a high, high cost. So with that very interesting uh, uh, perspective, just look at the statistics of what, what's happening. DBAs are still almost 60% of change introducers. They are the one driving the change. They keep to, they are the bottleneck. Sorry to be calling you bottlenecks, uh, uh, data, uh, database administrators. This is with all the love I, I can say it, but there's no way to win that game with the old, pro, the old processes. And if you look at the graph on the left, this is 2017 versus expectation to 2018. You can see how everyone all around, big organizations, small organizations, everyone is expecting to drive more releases more frequently. Okay, more than once a day. Just look, 40% 40, 40 going up to 24%. This is, this is continuous paste. This is not a, a, a weekly or bi-weekly or, or once a month release, okay? And, and if you just see, you know, moving to, to, to once a week or, or, or a few times a month, this is almost everybody. There's no way you could play that game and, and, and still drive changes in the, same, in the same process. So what can we do about it? How can we solve that dilemma between, uh, or the tension between uh, development needs to run faster and DBAs needs to actually uh, control what's happening and there's a, a loophole you can actually do this you can do this by automating a lot of the things that the DBAs would do uh, but instead of doing this like statistically instead of reading some pieces of the code some uh, 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 I don't know uh, portion of, of the release and, and trying to see if everything is okay you could essentially analyze everything by means of automation so each a uh, uh, security role, each uh, 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 credentials of who could actually push changes to what environment. Instead of doing that manually, you could have that tagged and automated through a tool, through a solution. You could say, okay, that person might push changes, but only to integration environment. Moving forward would require other people's permission. And more than that, just by implementing organizational policies, you could save a lot of, of, of that uh, inspection or uh, uh, code reviews. Just just realize what happens if a developer writes a drop table command and 
which might be perfectly fine for his development environment, but somehow uh, he decided it needs to go into that next, it, it checks that in, it goes into the next release. If you have just, uh, let's say, a very simplistic script-based automation or uh, even Jenkins-based automation, that would be very efficiently ran wherever you run it. And, and I, had, uh, I heard Jim Kim saying a, a great sentence about uh, having uh, the ability to run very quickly or to drive very quickly just has to, 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 to be uh, in, uh, included with another thing, being able to break quickly. So great speed without great breaks is, is, is a big danger. You're going to hit that wall. So having in place policies that say, okay, you cannot drop a table or you cannot rebuild that index in production midday because you're going to stop the whole uh, 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 production is exactly the way that 90, 95% of the benign changes can go easily through, but whenever something requires your attention, it is going to be highlighted and, and, and reviewed uh, as, as a requirement to go forward. And of course, if you have that audited, that is uh, uh, perfectly uh, com uh, completed uh, from your security point of view. So uh, the last secret I wanted to share with you, uh, and really uh, I think where ops is, is in perspective is how people are introducing changes. Uh, actually, if, if you look at the graph on the, on the right, uh, we see people still making direct SQL commands on the database. This is, this is highly, highly dangerous. This is not repeatable. This is not scalable. And, and you said nobody would do that, but a lot of people are. And, and, and you would say, no problem. I have, I have uh, my automation. I, I script it. And yet, if you look on the, on, on the left side and look at the amount of failures that you have, you can see two things on, on, on the left graph. Uh, if you look at the left side of that graph uh, is, uh, is uh, the amount of, of failures that you're having on frequent releases. So essentially, uh, people driving um, script-based or manual-based uh, uh, processes are having a lot more failures than people doing the, 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 the manual process on the right side, on, on the most uh, right side of, of, of the graph. So this is obvious. The quicker you run, the more stable your process needs to be. Because if you just run script, if you just typed it, God forbid, into the database, you're going to fail a lot. So we need to find a way to solve that as well. And, and, and this is, again, where uh, uh, DMSO can offer some uh, or a lot of, of uh, validity into the process. So if you remember, I, I mentioned the process that DBAs are, are doing as a manual process, which is hard to scale. We're just automating the same process. So evaluating, is your role enough to be able to, to, to permit you to push that change forward? Is the content good enough to go forward? Maybe you're introducing uh, a query which is dynamic and, and, and in some cases the organization says, well, we don't want that kind of queries or that kind of database changes because this opens up uh, the possibility to do a, a spoofing of, of, of your SQL scripts. And this is uh, a security vulnerability. This can be stopped before it even gets into the release loop. But once it goes forward, each time you do a release, we would actually uh, Look at the configuration of the database. Make sure that it matches what you're expecting. And as long as it matches, we can do the release, log and audit everything, and then revalidate that the release was uh, uh, successful. But if something fails in that validation process, if the configuration is not what you're expecting, because there's a hard fix to production or to staging, you need to know about it before you run the scripts, because the scripts are just scripts. They would override anything in that database. So a script that, said, that has a, a create or replace would create or replace. It doesn't know what's in the database. And this is plain risky. This is why we're seeing failures on, on, on some things that people would consider safe. You know, yeah, I have a script. What's, what's the problem? So of course, uh, uh, this is just, again, uh, another example of, of, of uh, a big hammer uh, with, with no, you know, no visibility of where you apply this. So uh, 
couple of slides just to talk about what the investor actually offers and, and, and we'll get uh, to the questions part. So the investor offers you uh, an easy way to create release pipelines to know what is uh, deployed in each uh, environment so you can easily uh, 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 link things with your uh, Jenkins, your CA, uh, atomic release automation with uh, any homegrown solution and essentially drive the changes efficiently yet safely. And safely is another example of saying, okay, so what happens when you have that hot fix? When you have that uh, a configuration drift in production and you know you want to know about first in advance, so you don't want to find about it during the release. Even if it stops the release, that's perfect. But why find about find find about it in, in the last moment if you can know about it in advance or as soon as it does uh, pick up? So DMS would uh, give you the ability to know about any configuration drift well in advance to see that an environment does not fit the configuration that you're expecting. So you could deal with that. You could either take the change and implement it back to development, or uh, uh, override it, or say it's okay and 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 just merge it back into development. But it's all about giving you the controls to to deal with these outliers and, and, and deal with any potential risk uh, for the release. Once you have that, you can zoom out and start analyzing what's happening. So as soon as you have that uh, 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 ability to say, okay, so what's happening on the larger scale? How did this project uh, uh, perform in comparison to other projects across time. So maybe it's running faster, but it's also having many more failures. And maybe that other project is right, uh, uh, driving a bit slower, but it has many, many less failures and, and actually delivering more content quicker and safer. So it's not just about measuring frequency. It's about dealing with these DevOps core cards, measuring lead time, deployment success, success, et cetera, or failures, and being able to just, not just look at, at, at the process from one perspective, but have, and this is, Scott, where I'll be happy to, to have you uh, chime in again, uh, having that end-to-end -end perspective of how a release would, would be uh, played out. So having that end-to-end uh, -end, uh, DevOps uh, infinity loop where you have uh, your code and database working together, uh, doing releases, seeing uh, operation in action, seeing being able to monitor and, 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 and highlight challenges. And, and I think uh, really this is where uh, uh, solutions like uh, uh, CA, release automation uh, that, that Scott is representing and, and, and the uh, uh that I am are working in synergy to create an end-to-end -end perspective of what you need as a customer to, to, in order to deliver that end result of, of, of your application. Yeah, exactly. And I even, the, the key is uh, automation. I look at automation as that conveyor belt for continuous delivery. If you're going to push things out the door, you need to have that automation as kind of the bedrock layer because that's really what helps them bind it all together and allows you to bake in uh, things like DB Maestro quality, all these other things that most uh, you know quality experts and many books have been written on quality before DevOps or modern technology talk about that these type of things cannot be secondary things to any process. They have to be part of the process. So by having that automation layer as the assembly line, as it were, moving across your environments and your your subject matter experts would allow all this tooling to, you know, be queued off and kicked off at the appropriate time in the appropriate place, including approvals and all that, really giving you that end-to-end -end, uh, perspective from when code is written to when it's actually deployed in production and the feedback loop from production uh, back in, feeding back into uh, developer stories that would then write new features and fixes and so forth. So yeah, it's definitely critical. And that's, that's the only way to create this feedback loop. It's got to be it really has to be automated. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so with that, uh, and, and, and leaving time for questions, uh, we have some, uh, you know, potential next steps for anyone either joining, joining a, a, a live demo webinar that we'll be running uh, uh, pretty soon, 
uh, dialing the slides, uh, downloading the slides from today's presentation, listening to the recording, or having that full survey that I mentioned, additional with uh, 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 CA's uh, amazing uh, map or, or metro map of, of uh, you know, what is DevOps and, and, and the different tooling that, that connected and, and of course, uh, uh, the connectivity between uh, uh, DMS and, 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 and CA Atomic. Um, with that, I, I will be very happy to take your questions. And um... okay. yep. so, Yannick, let me help jump in here on the questions. Before we get to them, though, first of all, great job, both of you. Yannick, the the live demo uh, for DB Maestro's DevOps Suite is Wednesday, December sixth. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And is there a link to register for that? I, it looks uh, like it is in the slides. The, the, link, is, the link is actually uh, here in the presentation. And, and of course, uh, it would be sent out uh, with the slides. And uh, we'll okay. be happy to give this to you as well. Yeah. So if you can, uh, if, if you could put that link into the chat window. Yeah, I think absolutely. we can actually get it out to everyone here. But with that said, let us let us jump into a couple of questions because we've got some good ones lined up. Um, first of all, more more a statement than a question is uh, Gustavo, who says that he's a DBA and he feels the same way. I think Yanov that you were talking about. People, uh, you know, they want everything deployed fast, but rolling back on an app is sometimes much easier. Uh, than rolling back in a database, which can take hours and hours of downtime on the databases. And so uh, that, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's a problem, right? I mean, it's one thing that just, I'm going to go to an earlier version of the app, but when you've got to roll back a database, things kind of grind to a halt pretty quickly. Yeah, uh, and, and it's not just rolling back. It's essentially any, any potential, uh, uh, you know, fix it, even if you don't need to roll back. And, and, and I, I mentioned the dropping of an index from a 200 million records uh, uh, table. That is actually something that happened to, to, to someone we were talking to. And it happened because of the very, I won't get into the details, but it happened too, too quickly, too easily. And it took down an application for a whole day because they even didn't know that it happened. So it's all about you know, having that control, making sure that you don't fail fast. That you don't fail at all, if, if if that's possible. Yep. All right. Next question uh, from Satish is: uh, You want to know if there were tools that are offering the kind of policy management on databases that you were re referring to? Okay. Um, actually, uh, yes, I was referring to to Demi Maestro. Uh, this is exactly what we're offering as as part of our uh, uh, DevOps suite. Um, being able to either use out of the box rules or create your own rules like uh, don't touch my general ledger table, don't add any columns to it or you know you could you could create any rules that you you want and by doing this I think it's it's really what uh, the DBA side of, of the equation loves about what we do because it gives them the control not to statistically look at the releases but to actually Make sure that nothing is missed, and and when you have that, you're halfway through. Yep, and and in a similar light, uh, Kishan asked, "Can DB Maestro help in creating these scripts?" Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Okay, next, does does DB Maestro have its own source code repository, or can you bolt it onto Team Foundation Server or Bitbucket? Um, it has an internal repository which is used uh, for validation of configuration, but we're exporting everything uh, to whatever uh, source control you might have or importing everything from whatever uh, source control you might have. So essentially, we could uh, uh, drop plugin DMS in an existing process and just change nothing in the way you introduce changes, take everything that the developers were creating and keep doing the secure, security aspects of, of the release with the validations and, and, and drifts, and et cetera, without changing anything in the way you actually introduce changes. So, so the, the answer is a big yes. Fantastic. Okay, next one. 
Um, does DB Maestro manage PL SQL procedures? Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, manages, tracks, highlights uh, about when you have drifts for them and, and essentially helps you fix them or roll them back very, very easily. Yes. Okay, Yanni, this is going to be a little bit of a tougher one. I, I don't even know myself. Have you no. heard of sqlpackage.exe from DACPAC from Microsoft yes. to deploy deltas on the scheme? On the scheme, or what's your take on it? Can you suggest a del data deltas tool? Uh, uh, SQL package is actually a, a great solution for uh, Microsoft based uh, uh, implementations. Uh, I like it personally uh, very much, uh, and and essentially, if you're having just just Microsoft SQL for a solution, and you don't mind creating the entire envelope of the process uh, around it, or what I really mean is is make that enterprise scale, you could use that. So it would function perfectly as a, as, a, as a solution to create that change script. But when you want to have that change script as part of a, a, a bigger release, track who did what, where they are allowed to do that, is that part of the policy, etc., then it will not deliver on this. So we definitely see uh, things like the SQL packages as, as a way just to create scripts that are part of the bigger process that, that we are helping with. Excellent. Got a lot of questions here. I'm sorry. Can you utilize a database input for rules into the DB Maestro offering? So, for instance, this is from State Stephen Bolt. We have our rules held in a database, and as such, it can read and write. It would be easier to manage. Uh, so, this is actually something that we don't do at the moment, but uh, we are uh, uh, planning to. So, uh, Mr. Bolt, uh, uh, your 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 idea is 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 making perfect sense, and and this is definitely something that is going to be uh, supported uh, on our, uh, our roadmap, and and absolutely yes, but not now. Okay, here's another good one. Is there a way of downloading the demo version and test for learning purposes? Uh, Yes, uh, you need to talk to our, uh, you know, uh, sales guys and, and, and you know, uh, there's, again, just to mention that there's the live demo that is, a go, uh, is going to go out in, on, on December uh, 6th. Uh, just, uh, there's a link on, 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 on the chat. Uh, you're welcome to join C and end to end demonstration of how everything is connected together. Uh, we'll be more than pleased to talk to anybody who's interested in, in, in what we're doing. Great. Another one. How does DB Maestro handle PLSQL object permissions? Uh, with great care and... <laughs> <laughs> Very carefully. I was thinking the same thing, but go ahead. You know what? Just, just to give another quick uh, example of how things are really uh, uh, connected. If you talk about uh, permissions, and you need to, to make sure that no uh, issues happen, just consider a developer uh, writing a, a silly code that says, grant DBA rights to all. That is something that could make itself into a script. That is something that must be uh, 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 stopped with the policies that I mentioned. Because again, this is the, the difference between just taking database scripts and looking at it from an enterprise perspective, this is really where you want to make sure that if you delegate the ability to introduce changes, you're not shooting yourself in the foot or in the head. Yep, agreed. And, and that, by the way, that transcends even just the DB piece of it, right? I, I often tell, don't, you know, DevOps is cool, it's relatively new, all of this stuff. But don't leave your common sense at the door. You know, a lot of things that worked in prior will, will work again as well. Anyway, next question. What other tools can DB Maestro be integrated with other than SQL Developer? Uh, essentially, um, we, we didn't talk specifically about uh, SQL Developer, but uh, 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 DB Maestro uh, for for, for uh, SQL connects with SMS, 
for uh, Oracle connects with the SQL developer, but essentially it's, it's not about the IDE. Uh, the version control might be benefiting from a plugin to an IDE, but the process is, is enforced through the database. So you could even work with uh, uh, a command line and SQL plus, yet if you're trying to introduce a change and, and, and that change is, is trying to be introduced um, to a table that some, someone else is working, even if you're going to do that from command line, it's going to be blocked because it's, it's, it's monitored through the database side and not through the IDE. So potentially you could use any, any IDE that you want and that would uh, uh, work with the process that we're enforcing. All righty. Um, so guys, we're past the top of the hour. We're going to need to pull the plug here. But before we do, um, just real quickly, in your chat section, Deborah uh, from DevOps.com has put a link to the registration for the uh, DB Maestro uh, demo webinar that they have going on. So please check that out. And uh, listen, Scott, Yanni, what can I say? This was, we've got a bunch more questions coming in, guys. But it's good you're typing them in here. We'll get them to Yanni and Scott. Maybe we'll do another webinar in the future continuing this. But for now, guys, thank you so much for a great, great webinar. You know, as DevOps continues to infiltrate the IT stack, it's time for DevOps to hit the, the database. And, and some of the work Yanni, you and the DB Maestro folks are doing are, are making that a reality. Thank you. Scott, thanks to UCA, Atomic, all the automation, ARA, great stuff. Everyone, thank you for joining us. We'll see you on our next DevOps.com webinar. But for now, this is Alan Schimmel for DevOps.com. Have a great day, everyone.